Have you ever felt like you didn't belong anywhere? Like you didn't fit in to anywhere on this earth? I have. And so I know that it can lead us to ask real human questions, good questions, questions that I think we're supposed to wrestle with. Questions like, who is God? Have you ever asked yourself that question? It's a question that can change depending on what we mean. Who is God? Like, what is he like? Is he righteous or is he just? Who is God? Like, which of these religions has the right one? Or maybe, who is God? Like, who does he think he is leaving me in my despair? These are questions that the story of Moses orbit around. Because these are questions that I would think the Israelites and Moses himself found themselves wrestling to answer. After all, God gives his answer to this prophet who was unwilling to speak for him. A priest who was reluctant to sacrifice because of his unholy past. A king who was terrified to lead because he knew he could never live up to the task that was before him. This is his story. Moses, the man of God. The story of Moses is a deeply human story, but to get the full depth of it, you really need to start back in the book of Genesis, when God tells Abram that his offspring are going to be enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. And so they were. And over the course of centuries, the Israelite people began to outnumber the Egyptians. So, when a new pharaoh arose over the land, a new king, who did not like the Israelites, a deep anti-Semitism began to course through the veins of the Nile. After some quick research, it soon becomes clear that this new pharaoh of Egypt forced the Israelites to build large and imposing temples to gods they did not worship. He forced them to build a nation founded on war and bloodshed. He ruthlessly made them work as slaves. All things that are directly opposed to the God of the Israelites. But when this did nothing to thwart the growth of Israel, Pharaoh demanded that every firstborn male be cast into the Nile and drowned. This is where we meet Moses. Moses was born into this chaotic mess around the year 1390 BC, under the Egyptian reign of Pharaoh Seti I. Moses is born into a long and complicated family history. If the genealogy of Exodus 6 is to be of any account, then by no means is Moses born into a perfect family. It's full of these weird interconnecting relationships. When Moses is born, his mother hides him so that he might have a chance at survival. But when the boy becomes too large or too loud, Moses' mother, Yochbed, is forced to trust in the God who has been silent all her life and she sets Moses adrift down the Nile River. In a basket made of bitumen and pitch, Moses drifts down the River Nile, 
and into the hands of Pharaoh's daughter. Tradition has made this royal residence the city of Tanis, where the daughter of Pharaoh may have been attending a religious ritual. Regardless, it's here, where she sees the child drifting and hears the child crying and takes pity on him. She names him Moses. In Hebrew, the word means drawn out of, like how Pharaoh's daughter drew Moses out of the water. But in Egyptian, the word is, it's just a suffix, and it means born of, like ra Moses, he's born of Ra. In this case, the daughter of Pharaoh would be saying that Moses was born of no one, drawn from nowhere. He is a man without an identity, who was set adrift and rescued by the most unlikely of hands. You see, Moses here becomes an image of the Israelite people, seemingly from nowhere, drawn through the water, and brought into a family that he has made an integral part of as a growing nation. Moses grows up in the palace of Pharaoh, likely becoming intimately familiar with Egyptian culture and history. He would have witnessed the violent military campaigns against the Hittite people to the north. And if I were to guess, I'd say he would have been a bit of an outcast in the palace of Pharaoh. Well, 40 years go by. When Moses looks out upon the burdens of the Israelite people, knowing that the Pharaoh was launching a campaign against the people of his own kind, the just heart of Moses cannot take it any longer. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And when he went out the next day, behold, there were two Hebrews struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? And he answered, well, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? And then Moses was afraid and he thought, surely the thing is known. And when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. And so Moses, he fled to the land of Midian. And when he got there, he sat down by a well, exhausted and hungry, no doubt. Off in the distance, a group of women appear on the horizon who have come to draw water for their herds. The story goes that suddenly, a band of rogue shepherds chase the women away. Despite his weariness, Moses rescues the women and then he waters their flock. When they go back, they relay this heroic tale to their village. Moses is invited to stay with the nomadic Midianites. Here, Moses marries Zipporah, who gives birth to a son named Gershom. During the time that Moses was in Midian, Seti I dies, and his son, Ramesses II, takes over. Ramesses II was more fiercely opposed to the Semitic people in his kingdom than his father. Therefore, the people of Israel cried and they groaned all the more because of the harshness of their slavery. Have you ever asked yourself, who is God? I'm sure the Israelites did. And I'm sure Moses did. Well, God saw the people of Israel and God knew. One day, Moses was tending to his father-in-law Jethro's flock of sheep. Moses had gone into the wilderness to the east, a very similar place that Adam and Eve would have found themselves, east of Eden. And so it's kind of unsurprising that we're told that Moses led the flock west, where he came to the mountain of God, Horeb. Something must have caught his eye that day, something miraculous. Because when Moses went over to get a better look, what he actually found was an answer to the question that he and his people had been asking for centuries. Moses, Moses, here I am. Do not come any nearer. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. 
I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and a broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you, that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. If I come to the people of Israel, and I say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And so, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said this, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. But here, Moses contends with the Lord. He is convinced that the Israelites will not believe him. So, God commands Moses to throw down his staff, and when he does, it becomes this venomous snake. But who has control over the snake? God commands Moses to pick it back up, and by the tail, no less. Again, the Lord gives Moses another sign. He commands Moses to put his hand into his cloak, but when Moses takes it out, his hand is all white and leprous. But who has command over sickness and death? So when God tells him to put his hand back in his cloak, it is restored. Even though God has definitively shown that he has command over death and creation, Moses still contests his position as prophet. Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of, of speech and of tongue. And then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. And then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach you both what to do. You know, don't forget here that Moses' reluctancy is a matter of national justice for his people. God is commanding him to bring his divine liberation through his prophetic voice and tear down the oppressive injustices of Egypt. So, something really important and clever is happening to the messianic story here. The prophetic role is being defined clearly in Exodus 3. Prophets are people who will speak the word of God to the people of God. And prophets will almost always be reluctant to accept God's call on their lives. So, if we are to be on the lookout for one claiming to be God's perfect Messiah, then they must be the, the perfect, ultimate, epitomized prophet. And so Moses here disqualifies himself for that. We're, we're looking for a better Moses. The Messiah must be so intimately connected and familiar with God's word that they, they might be God's word incarnate walking on the earth. And God's Messiah must acquiesce that his will be done. Further, in contrast to God's prophets, 
we will see an earthly, imperial evil. That's why it's best to see Pharaoh as an archetype of the evil that met Adam and Eve in the garden. Cunning, oppressive, the bringer of death. God here has revealed himself to be the God who has sovereign control over the created order. Here, he has revealed himself to have an active interest in liberating the enslaved. So it is here that God reveals himself to have providential control over the nations, over injustice, over Pharaoh himself. God says that he will harden the heart of Pharaoh. And this often poses a serious moral conundrum for modern readers. Hear what S.R. Driver says in his book, Exodus. The means by which God hardens a man is not necessarily by any extraordinary intervention on his part. It may be by the ordinary experiences of life operating through the principles and characters of human nature, which are of his appointment. Consequently, as R. Alan Cole points out in his commentary, this is the same reasoning that the Lord gives for couching his truths in parables. From this difficult story, however, we move right on into the next complicated tale. But they complement one another. You see, Moses packs his bags with his wife and his children, and they begin the journey back to Egypt. Suddenly, God meets them in the wilderness, seeking to put him to death. But Zipporah, like Moses' mother and the daughter of Pharaoh, intervene on his behalf and save the family, save his life. She circumcises the firstborn male, Gershom, and she cries out, You are a bridegroom of blood before Moses. Even in ancient times, this text was difficult for interpreters to decipher. However, by seeing Pharaoh as a representative of the cunning snake, we see the story pop. While many interpretations have been given, and they all deserve some credence, we should at least see how God has promised to harden Pharaoh's heart and kill his firstborn son because Pharaoh is holding God's firstborn son, Israel, hostage to death. Therefore, as the snake brought death to all humanity, so Pharaoh brings death to God's son, and God will react likewise. In the same way, the context of this story seems to indicate that Moses withheld circumcision from his son actively. Moses is holding his son in bondage to death, like Pharaoh is over Israel. But if nothing else, we see that life is brought to the child when he is grafted into God's family. You see, this story foreshadows the very nature of who God is revealing himself to be. So Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh. They ask the Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go and worship in the wilderness. However, Pharaoh is suspicious of the request. Pharaoh says, look, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. Therefore, Pharaoh told the overseers, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifices to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor at it, and pay no regard to lying words. But Moses can't quite see what God is doing yet. He goes away from Pharaoh and pleads with God. Here, God reassures Moses that he is making a way for their salvation. And so the Lord said to Moses, Go in and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. And so Moses and Aaron did so. But Pharaoh refuses to listen. And so began the trials of Egypt in the form of ten plagues. This undoing of creation also sets God's people against the gods of Egypt, the Nile, the earth, the livestock, the health of the people, the sun itself, until finally, the firstborn of Pharaoh. The first plague turns the Nile River to blood, and the second calls frogs to cover the land, while the third plague turned the very dust of the earth into gnats. 
Despite early warning signs, still, Pharaoh refuses to let the people go, and his heart remained stubborn. Flies covered the land and the livestock of Egypt died. Then boils broke out upon the people. The king of Egypt remained unmoved, unconvinced that his gods were weakened. So hail rained down from the heavens, and locust blocked out the sun, Ra himself. And if that weren't enough, Atum was destroyed when light was cast into such a darkness that it could be felt. In the midst of this darkness, the pharaoh sat unmoved. His heart was so calloused that he refused to accept defeat or relinquish control. That would, after all, prove he were not a god. The final plague was set to be the most severe. It was called to reflect the very injustice that Pharaoh had committed against the people of Israel. So God called Moses to him, and he warned him of this coming doom. God commanded that all the people of Israel Take an unblemished lamb and kill it at twilight. They're called to put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and then eat a meal with their families in haste. When the Spirit of God comes and he sees the blood of the lamb, he will pass over that door and death will not come to the family. But if the blood of the lamb is not present, then death is the only sure outcome. That night, as the earth sat in darkness, the people ate in their homes quickly. And quietly, the Lord passed through the land of Egypt. Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. And then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night, and he said, Up! Go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go! Serve the Lord as you have said. And in haste, the people did as the Lord had told them. They asked for gold and silver, and they were given it. But word had spread, and not only had Israel been spared, but a mixed multitude went out with them. Thus, the people of God had been saved by a mighty hand, and formed into a new nation. To this day, the Passover is celebrated in remembrance of God's deliverance. God let the people of Israel out of Egypt by a pillar of fire at night. By day, the Lord appeared to them as a pillar of cloud. And the people followed God wherever he went. And soon, God led the people to Pi Hahiroth, nearly a day's journey away. In front of them was the vast Red Sea. But behind them, the army of Pharaoh quickly approached. Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. And so the pillar of God moved between the people of God and the Egyptians as Moses raised his staff high into the air. Suddenly, a strong west wind made the sea a dry land, and the chaotic waters of uncreation stood up on either end as a wall, divided for the people to pass safely through. Atu had never done anything close. And when the people got to the other side, the waters closed back in on themselves, and the army of Pharaoh, an army of death, was tossed into the sea.
Israel saw the great power that the Lord had used against the Egyptians. And so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord, and in his servant Moses. The people of God looked out over the deliverance that God had won for them. They looked out upon a God who had complete control over the land and over the sea. They saw their God who overthrew the Egyptian pantheon as though without even trying. They immediately saw him as the king of all creation, the one who has control over all of the nations. And the people of God looked out, and they had an answer in their yearning hearts to their profoundly simple question that they had been asking their entire lives. He is the God who saves. Hey, Austin here. Just a quick reminder about Bible Unbound and the content you just watched, which was supported by our funders over on Patreon.com. Patreon is where you try to get a bunch of people to donate small amounts to fund a mission. And the mission of Bible Unbound is to discover the Bible by uncovering the gospel. You see, we are passionate about creating a community of people who want to see Bible-curious people understand the Bible by seeing the gospel and Jesus proclaimed throughout the entire thing. And so if you want to fund that mission, if you want to become a part of the vision we have over here at Bible and Bound, you can explore more of that over on patreon.com. We'd love to see you there. Thanks so much.